and gentlemen. Hi, Ben. Hi, how are you doing? Are we coming through okay? Yeah. Okay, Bob, it's been a couple of years since we did a radio show. I guess the last one that uh, we did with you, and Gene has been on this program several times, but was with the old show over at KIEV. A lot of things have been happening since then, haven't they? Uh... I imagine, yeah. <laughs> okay, what I'm referring to primarily, Bob, the first thing I wanted to talk about is the fact that it appears, and the information that we received at UFO Magazine, is that there are some people interested in doing your story for the big screen. Oh, yeah, yeah, there's a movie in progress. Well, now, how far along is this coming? Uh, have they started to shoot yet? No, they haven't, they haven't actually started production. They tell me very little. Is the script completed? Okay. For you folks that may not know who Robert Lazar are, and if, if that's probably the case, then you've probably uh, just either entered the UFO field or uh, you've been living in a cave. Uh, in 1989, the story was first broken by television journalist George Knapp, who was at that time with KLAS in Las Vegas, Nevada. Story of an individual that was working at probably one of the most secret facilities anywhere in the world. And that is an area that in those days was known as Area 51 and Site 4. It's my understanding, Bob, that since then uh, those names have been changed about somewhat. Area 51 and S4? Yes. Well, there are a lot of different names for Area 51, and I think they, they changed it again recently. Uh, the scorecard or something like that, the last I heard. Uh, and what S4 is called now, I have no idea. But at that time, the basic uh, crux of your story, Bob, was that you were one of those probably, literally, it could be counted on like two or three hands, people that were privileged to work on allegedly recovered extraterrestrial technology. Right. The group I worked in consisted of 22 people. And what we're talking about is actual alien technology or purportedly alien technology that was somehow recovered by the United States government from off-world. Uh, I know that you've, you've told this story a gazillion times, but basically what was your part of the job? And when you went out there, did you have any idea in the world that this is what it might be? Uh, no, when I went out, I had no idea what it was. I thought it was going to be an advanced propulsion system, probably a field propulsion system that uh, was being developed, and I was anxious to get to work on it. Uh, it was only later on that... Uh, I was told what we were really doing wasn't developing something. It was back in engineering something that was already developed, and uh, it was of an extraterrestrial nature. Don, if I might interject, you, you mentioned before that uh, Bob had allegedly worked on recovered craft, and Bob never asserted that the craft were recovered. He never assigned uh, any, any uh, place of origin to the craft, but he never said they were recovered because that implies to a lot of people that maybe these were the discs that were recovered from Roswell or somewhere, and Bob never asserted that. Well, however they came down, our government recovered them somehow, whether they were a gift or right. whether they were a, yeah, that's, that's correct. a crash or, or whether they were shot down or whatever. Uh, well, we're talking about one of the biggest stories that could conceivably uh, happen I would think, in, in human history. And incidentally, ladies and gentlemen, let me, let me tell you this. I want you to hold off on telephone calls until after the half-hour break. I want to spend the first half hour just basically speaking to Bob and Jean. And after the half-hour break, then please feel free to call the lines. But I'm not even going to give the phone numbers out until 9.30. Uh, for, so for, you, for those people that are presently on the line, I'm going to ask uh, the engineer to go ahead and hang those phones up, and you can call back. Okay, Bob, one of the things that uh, has come out since this story, uh, and there have been many people within the UFO community that have looked upon the information that you provided with a very jaundiced eye. And one of the big things that have been continually brought up is your apparent lack of academic credentials. A lot of people have been trying to find uh, the academic credentials. I've seen people within the UFO field refer to you as Dr. Lazar, and you've never I've stated... I've heard that, too. <laughs> yeah, you, you've never stated you, you hold a Ph.D., is no, that correct? No, absolutely right? not. That's ridiculous. Your, your educational background up to this part, you have a master's? Yes, in physics and electronic technology. Okay. Now, how do you respond to the critics that claim that they have not, with the exception of, I believe, one junior college, that these people have not been able to, uh, to find First any... First of all, I don't... I don't respond. I am the one that brought that up. Okay. That was part of my original concern 
And part of the reason that I went forward is because uh, essentially all of my background disappeared. Everything from birth certificates to past jobs to uh, employment at Los Alamos, so on and so forth. And uh, it was only, uh, well, it was when I, I contacted George Knapp and began telling him what was going on, uh, you know, that this, this ever got out. And uh, apparently now people are bringing this up as it's like it's, it's brand new news. Hey, Bob, your background's gone. You know, it's, uh, this, is, uh, this is one of the first things that I brought up even, even before I came out with the information. It was truly my concern about what was going to happen in the future as far as uh, my well-being. What would be the reason for erasing everything in my background? Um, Don, we had the, uh, the good fortune to go listen to George Knapp speak here at, in, at a library uh, get-together in, in Las Vegas last week, and he, he addressed some of those subjects, and essentially George is in the process of back engineering, so to speak, Bob's background, because it's pretty much been established that Bob did work at Los Alamos, and obviously Bob did not get a job there because he had one electronics course at Pierce Junior College. Well, I've, I've known about this, this story almost since the very beginning, and of course I... Well, Los Alamos, in fact, very recently admitted, and I think, I don't want to get the quote misstated, but I think almost verbatim, uh, they said apparently what Mr. Lazar has told you is true. They told this to George Knapp as far as uh, the employment there, what I did, what I was involved in, so on and so forth. Uh, and this is because... I imagine the person, you remember that person's name, Gene? No, uh, George just said there had been a transition. The old public relations director or whatever had left and a, a new, new one came yeah. in. And then uh, they didn't know the, the deal on the Bob Lazar chase. And uh, she gave George a lot of new information. So George is working on that right now. Well, your, your name, Bob, was listed in a, an old phone book at Los Alamos. Uh, right, but you, you've got a lot of people saying that... Uh, Oh, sure, you worked at Los Alamos, but maybe you were a cook there. <laughs> you know, it, because your name's in the phone book, it doesn't say what you did. And, uh, you know, that's why when George now first did this story, you know, we both flew to Los Alamos, and George spoke to some of my colleagues and friends that I'd worked with there, uh, you know, and some of the people that I went to school with later here in Las Vegas, some of the people came out. Well, Bob, after you, after you left Pierce, where did you attend school at? After I left Pierce, I went to Northridge for a short amount of time, and then at that time, I got a job at Fairchild Electronics, which was in Canoga Park at that time, and then moved out to Simi Valley. And while I was in Simi Valley, that's when I started attending Caltech, and I purposely had to rearrange my schedule at uh, Fairchild so I can make the drive out to Pasadena. Now, you were going under your own name at that point, is that correct? Robert Lazar. <laughs> yeah, that's an odd question. Well, I mean, there are, there are people, uh, and just recently, as a matter of fact, I, I just spoke to Gene uh, a few weeks ago, and I'm sure he mentioned it to you, that it was my understanding there were some people, even as we speak right now, that have been attempting to do an in-depth check on your background in order to discredit you and one of the things that uh, was suggested is that you were attending school under a different name. All this is insane to me. You can't uh, imagine, I mean you kind of have to put yourself in my shoes uh, where all of a sudden you have a lot of people, some of them, big Stan Friedman for instance, there's a guy that lives in a different country who I've never met and uh, you know, he essentially asserts he knows more about me than I do. And uh, it, it's absolutely ridiculous and frustrating because I will not give any of these people any of my time. They're running around trying to figure out where I went to high school. But the bottom line is not where I went to high school or what I did in my spare time or who my friends were at, at MIT or Caltech for that matter. The bottom line is the story that I've, I, you know, I have essentially brought forward. And it's just amazing to me that the attention has been drawn away from that. I mean, that is essentially the most important thing. Well, I think, as, as you found out, there are large segments, uh, Bob and Gene, of the UFO field that are definitely fruit, nut, and flake. You know, we're talking about granola cereal here. But, but Don, it, it's uh, on, on Bob's behalf. For instance, if he did, uh, if he, one of their complaints, and justifiably, I mean, this is a very critical subject really to all of our lives, our theology and philosophy and history and everything, so they want proof.
But if Bob produced diplomas, which he doesn't have, if he produced them from Caltech and MIT and the schools wouldn't verify that he graduated from there, then all people would say is that he uh, fraudulently, fraudulently had diplomas printed up. So actually, the only way probably to verify any of this is to try and round up the records from Kirk Meyer or Los Alamos because anybody can have a diploma printed. If the school doesn't back you up, it's equally as invalid. Absolutely. And let me also say this, that many people assume that the Area 51 story started with you, Bob. Uh, as a matter of fact, in uh, Richmond, Virginia this past summer, George Knapp did an eloquent talk about his research into this area that went, went on well before there was uh, anyone that, that anyone in the field knew as Bob Lazar. Uh, the fact that there have been uh, much very top secret, very black projects that have been going on at uh, the area known as Area 51 has been going on for almost 40 years. Uh, is it not true that, that Knapp uh, has come across other people that were not willing to go forward, perhaps because of some of the things that happened to you from your going forward? Yes. Yeah, he's, he's run into a couple people that work down there, or have worked down there in the past. And uh, George presented that similar speech at the library this week, Don, and, and it's very good. In other words, he has taught people that the the entire validity of the fact that the government may be back engineering extraterrestrial vehicles at F4 does not totally hinge on Bob Lazar. Absolutely. There's a lot of contributory evidence. Absolutely. And gentlemen, we are just a little past. I had to take a break anyway. Let me put you on hold for just a moment. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, more with my guests this evening, Mr. Robert Lazar and his friend and associate, Mr. Gene Huff of Las Vegas, and that perennial fascinating topic of UFOs. And now, back to this classic interview with Robert Lazar and Gene Huff. So, there's a lot coming up. Stick around. We are back with my guest, Mr. Robert Lazar, and his friend and associate, Mr. Gene Huff, who's been a guest on this program several times. Gentlemen, one of the things about the UFO field that uh, many people have a really hard time understanding, and Bob, with, with your background, uh, and the type of work that you conducted at Area 51, perhaps you would be even in a better position to, to answer this question. The, the question is perennially raised, why would our government, if in fact it does have knowledge of extraterrestrials, be hiding this fact from the public, especially today when the Cold War, in effect, is over. There is no more evil empire, no more Soviet Union. Uh, I mean, you know, let's face it, uh, who are our enemies? Any one of them we could crush in a week if, if it came to a war. So what are we hiding this for, and who are we hiding it from? Obviously, we're hiding it from the American people, and uh, or the rest of the world, for that matter. And why? Your guess is as good as mine. I really don't uh, don't try and... To stretch too far because there are so many possibilities, so many scenarios, so many different stories that may be true and may not be, and you know can alter the uh, answer to that question. So I, I, I really don't even try and guess answers to those questions. Well, you know, one of the one of the the questions that the critics, as far as your case, have raised, and since I've known about your case, and since I. Uh, had the opportunity to meet you several years ago. Your story has never changed, unlike many people in the field. Um, I could name names, but you know, at this point, what well, well, would be the point? Right. Your, your story has, has never, in effect, changed. But uh, when you came forward, one of the items that you offered for proof, and as a matter of fact, we ran it in, in UFO magazine, was the W-2 that purportedly you were sent for the time that you spent working at this top secret area. No, that's not what that was for. Okay. That was for that was a retroactive check that I got that would have preceded or that did precede my paychecks and because I was essentially my pay was started as my background investigation begun before I had actually worked out there. And that's what that's why there's a small amount of money on that check. Okay. But the point that I was making, Bob, there have been many critics and, and naysayers, as far as your case, or, uh, your case is concerned, that have claimed that that W-2 was fraudulent. Uh, one of the things that they point out is that when the uh, W-2 was issued, it had on the face of it from the Department of Naval Intelligence. Uh, 
how do you answer you know that? Because as we both know, and as Gene knows, there is no per se Department of Naval Intelligence. Do you think that this was deliberately done to throw it off the track? Now I know that there have been people that have tried to track this down. One of them, uh, a man by the name of Bob Exler, uh, who proceeded trying to uh, track down some of the numbers that was on the, that was on this W-2. Now I don't have it in front of me, but what have you guys been able to find out about that? I don't actively pursue it, and never has. I mean, that's uh, I got the check, the W-2 form, deposited into the W-2 form in my you know tax box, and that was the end of it. Um, as far as what Bob Exler has done to uh, trace it down, Gene, I think knows quite right. a bit about that. Don, I think some important things about that are, and, and if you remember, even when I, I think I was probably the fir first one to tell you about it, we brought up the fact that it said Department of Naval Intelligence on it. I mean, any. Any moron who can open a government directory knows that that is called the ONI, the Office of Naval Intelligence. Right. Uh, we thought possibly the Department of Naval Intelligence may have been a front company or just another name to divert, to divert funds. Uh, Bob had always been under the suspicion that the funds for this program were being skimmed off the FBI budget. And uh, so we knew that. Uh, before he released the W-2 to the public. Also, another thing is people checked the zip code on the W-2 and said, oh, well, that's a, a holding pattern zip code uh, for a place in Washington, D.C., which was true, and John Andrews of the Tester Corporation did some research, and the fact is, with that zip code, you simply write NIC-01 for Naval Intelligence Command on the envelope, and it is forwarded from that zip code to Naval Intelligence Command somewhere in Maryland. Uh, so there were, there were a lot of things. Uh, also, the, the personal verification on that W-2 was that after Bob received it, I think, uh, I don't even think his, his wife at that time, Tracy, knew how much his check was for. He showed me the amount the check was for when he received it. And when he received the W-2, you know, months later, uh, it had the same amount on it. Now, of course, if I was trying to falsify information, that wouldn't be worth a nickel. But the fact is, if that W-2 was falsified, uh, for disinformation or, or whatever, or even if it's true, whoever did make that W-2 did know how much Bob Lazar had made during the year 1988. All right. Now, uh, something else that has come up, uh, and there have been questions raised about this. If, in fact, um, a department or an agency or a cabal of people were trying to totally erase a paper trail, Bob, as far as your, as your background goes and so forth, it would seem that it would have to be an incredibly complex thing. Now, for example, I just recently had to apply for a passport, and I could not find my birth certificate. So, and I'm just talking about a few weeks ago, so I called up some relatives back east where I'm originally from, had them get the birth certificate from the Department of Vital Statistics. They sent it out to me, and so on and so forth. But as I did that, believe it or not, I was thinking about your case. And in order for someone to totally erase my existence, uh, with every place that I've lived, with the different jobs that I've had, with my military background and so forth, it would seem that it would take a literal entire agency to cover everything. Now, how do you think they could have accomplished this task with you? Well, they certainly didn't cover everything. They missed tremendous gaps here and there. Well, let's talk about that. Uh, the only places where they covered were companies and or organizations directly connected to the United States government. Everything else they missed. And that makes complete sense to me. Do you think they missed it intentionally or do you think... No, they probably had no power of control over those areas. Okay. And Don, that's easily achieved. You know, we live in the age of computers. For instance, uh, again, John Andrews from Tester down in Southern California had... Uh, uh, had extensive correspondence with the Office of Naval Intelligence Command, as well as the Department of Treasury, as well as the IRS. And he asked them point blank, uh, in 1988 or 1989, uh, did this uh, employer number on Bob Lazar's W-2 exist, yes or no? And the letter came back from the Assistant Chief Counsel, I believe, for, for the Department of Treasury, and said that the employer number that de on Bob's W-2, which designated the Department of Naval Intelligence, did not currently exist. Now, this was in 1991, a couple of years later. And furthermore, they had no practical way of ascertaining whether it ever existed, which is total baloney. You know if they wanted to audit you from 1988, they could pull your entire financial life up on the screen, and they're insisting that, that other than the current year, they have no way of uh, ascertaining what employer identification numbers were in past years uh, for the Navy or anyone else for that matter. 
All right, gentlemen, we're going to have to take the half hour break. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to just stand by, bear with me. Okay. My name is Don Ecker. The show is UFOs Tonight. And we are back with my guest, Mr. Robert Lazar and Mr. Gene Huff. Well, gentlemen, the telephone lines have already started to light up. Uh, are you up for a few phone calls? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Let's go to Owensboro, Kentucky. We have Mike calling in. Good evening, Mike. What's on your mind? Uh, hello, Don. It's Mike. You know me. Okay, sure. How you doing? Yeah. Picking uh, us up on satellite. You're on satellite. Rob, I met you in uh, May the 2nd out at uh, Rachel at the conference out there. Uh-huh. I, I can't say I remember, but... Uh, right. I uh, there were so many people there. talking to you. It's hard for you to remember, I imagine. And, Gene, I've talked to you several times. Oh, on the phone? Uh, yeah, Mike Crystal. Oh, yeah, right. How you doing? Good. Bob, I just want to review here for a minute. Uh, you were talking about the uh, uh, Naval Department, uh, Naval Intelligence. Uh, did, in fact, uh, you not work for them rather than for a contractor? No, I, while I was at S4, I worked directly for them. That's who I was paid right. from anyway. And uh, there have been people saying that that department did not exist, but... Uh, I have a friend who works within the government that told me that, in fact, that department did, in fact, exist. Well, yeah, I, I myself know it exists, but uh, uh, I, I've heard that from other people, too. Oh, what did your friend say about what the capacity was of the Department of Naval Intelligence? Well, uh, he wasn't in a position to talk about it too much. Did he say exactly what it was that they did, Mike? Uh, no, he wouldn't divulge too much other than to confirm that it did exist and it had existed from back, uh, you know, uh, in the late 40s, uh, about the time that the Roswell and all this stuff came in. Well, is there a paper trail on them? I mean, is, are they within a certain department that uh, that they could be pinpointed? I don't know. I didn't press it because of his position within the government. But I can't ask again. Okay. Remember, this is the land of the free and the home of the brave. I, I understand that, but I don't want to lose my contact, if you know what I mean. <laughs> okay. I want to thank you, Mike, for calling in. Yeah, we'll talk to you all again. You okay. take care. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. Speaking of government agencies, Bob, uh, that are not known to the public, during the, the course of, of uh, the aftermath of what happened after you did go public, uh, you were, uh, were you not, uh, basically your home was invaded one day by federal agents uh, with whom you thought were originally with the FBI that kind of went through there jotting down notes and what have you? Yeah, they had come by a couple times. And one of the men you were able to identify by name, a man by the name of Mike Figpen, but when uh, you and Knapp tried to track him down, it turned, it, it turned out, did it not, that he was not with the FBI but with another federal agency? Right. Well, I never tracked anybody down. Um, George did, George Knapp did go on track and down, and he was with, um... Actually, I think that is to John Andrews' uh, credit again, uh, from Tester Corporation. Well, John Andrews came up with the fact that, uh, I don't know who uncovered that they were from the Office of Federal Investigation, either George or John, but John came up with the actual phone numbers of the offices, as well as Mike Bigben's boss's name, and this, uh, this, uh, whatever, the Office of Federal Investigation verifies uh, people's backgrounds for uh, secure jobs, and they're based out of something called the Office of Personnel Management or something like that I'm back in Pennsylvania. So these people are, in fact, federal investigators. Right, right. Now, he, did he identify himself as FBI, or was that... Was that yeah, I, I honestly don't remember that. At, at, at that time, I just thought everyone... Well, I, the reason I thought it was FBI, because that's who did the investigation uh, for my acute clearance when I was at Los Alamos. And I think I just automatically assumed when these guys started showing up, they're FBI, and uh, it was a normal background check. I never, I really didn't know that there was another uh, department that handled that solely. I remember back then, he wasn't uh, Bob Lazar, the UFO mechanic, either. He just thought he was <laughs> being cleared for some secret job, and it wasn't, you know, he wasn't alarmed as to make sure who was investigating him and, and why they were doing it. Okay, now this entire scenario, though, actually... Uh, you're finally getting this job, Bob, for, for those people that may not know, actually began back in Los Alamos with a meeting you had with uh, uh, the father of the H-bomb, Dr. Edward Teller, did it not? That's correct. And now let me see if I have this correct, because it's been a while since, you know, since I've, I've talked to you or since uh, I've done anything with this particular case, but uh, did he not put you in touch with 
people at uh, government contractor in Las Vegas, EG&G? That's, that's also correct, yeah. Okay, now these folks, among one of their many things that they do, do they not prepare nuclear uh, triggers for atomic weapons? That, yeah. Okay. All right, let's go back to the phones. We have Bill in Sherman Oaks on United Artists. Good evening, Bill. Hi, how are you? Very good. Do you have a question for my guest? Yeah, just a couple. I, I just wanted to say a thanks to Bob for exposing himself to the public here tonight and giving us an opportunity to, to talk to him. And I was, I was going to ask him if he happened to know exactly what's uh, happened with Billy Goodman. I, I've spoken to Bob a couple times on uh, his program back in that era. Uh, believe it or not, <laughs> Billy Goodman, after all this time, finally got a hold of me uh, a few weeks ago. And uh -huh. he is out on the East Coast, Rhode Island. Yeah, okay, Rhode Island. And uh, he's got a little, uh, I think it just went satellite, uh, a small radio show going on out there. Yeah, he's a short he, wave station. He, as a matter of fact, Bob, called me up a few days ago uh, and told me that his show just had gone on short wave. So, yeah, you're, you're absolutely correct. My, my question, uh, Bob, uh, I asked you uh, this question once before on his program. And uh, your reply was that the uh, spaceships that uh, you have uh, worked on and seen there up at SR-4 were similar or exactly like the same type of uh, telemeter ships that are in the Billy Myers book. Is, is that correct? They were very, well, the one, I, I only worked on one of the craft, and uh, one of them is very, very similar. To uh, I don't know what Billy Myers calls it, but one of the one of the photographs it is is very very similar to it. Uh, however, there are some there are some differences. One of them is the size, and uh, a couple other a couple other points which don't really come to mind right now. But uh, it was it's extremely similar to it. And that that's 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 interesting. Would you say that there's any correlation between the two uh, in uh, 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 ships uh, as far well, as uh, there, uh, you know, Visually speaking, I don't know what uh, Billy Myers has ever said about the inside of the craft, but as far as the external view of the craft, uh, that certainly can't be a coincidence. Whoever produced that craft or whatever produced that craft certainly uh, produced the one that was down at S4. You believe so? On that, uh, on that note, also, we're, uh, we're in the process of actually remaking and expanding the Lazard tape with uh, some guys down at a, at a special effects studio in Hollywood, and and Bob has actually scaled the disc up from the gravity amplifiers, which he saw uh, firsthand at very close range. And uh, so in the new upcoming remake of the Lazard tape, it'll, it'll have the new dimensions. An interesting point, though, is that what, what he also exposes in the, uh, the new tape is the frequency of the carrier wave uh, for gravity A, the gravity A wave, which emanates from the element 115. And an interesting point is when Billy Myers recorded uh, the audio sound uh, the alleged audio sound of a disc, uh, they had that sound, they had that tape analyzed, and they found out that all of the sound waves converged on an electromagnetic wave between 5 and 10 hertz cycles, and indeed, that's where Bob learned that the, uh, that's the same range that the gravity A wave, a wave which uh, emanates from the 115 is, so that's a pretty big coincidence. That, that is a, a, very, a very big coincidence. Uh, Bob, I'm sure you've probably thought about the fact that the craft that you worked on would only seat small people, whereas uh, Semjazi is uh, much larger than, than four feet tall, per se. Yeah, I really don't know much about uh, you know, what, what Billy Myers saw, other than some of the pictures that, that some people have showed me. But, All right. Well, Bill, I want to thank you for your call. The phone lines are lit up. We've got a lot of people uh, that, that I want to get to, but uh, keep those eyes to the skies, and thank you for your call. Thank you very much. All right. Let's go to line two. We have Fritz from Westlake. Good evening, Fritz. Uh, good evening, gentlemen. What a special treat stand you put on tonight. Well, thank you. First of all, I'm so glad that the Billy Meyer name comes up and he gets some respect because this case is not going to go away. And like I said before, Mutt's going to fly in lab of UFO researchers' face once the case will be authenticated. Now, question to Bob Lassar. In his last four years when he came out, uh, he answered a lot of questions over the air. I mean, there must have been hundreds and hundreds of calls calling in. Perhaps you will remember me, Bob, because it was the fourth or the fifth show uh, when you were on the Billy Goodman show when I made a small prediction, tiny prediction, that someday Hollywood will make a documentary about you and you will get your day in court. 
Well, I, I, I can't say I remember it, but uh, if, if that was your prediction, I guess. Uh, that was about the fourth or fifth time you won the Billy Lisko Stud in 89, and I said, because I see the... Uh, the potential of the case and, and the uh, this is the way you spoke and everything and uh, it's just run right in my head and I made this small prediction that eventually someday you will get your day in court and I'm so happy for you and that you get some financial rewards and that you came out because Bob, with the evidence, George Knapp is coming out in a few weeks or whenever, a month, whenever his documentary will be released. It's there, it's sitting up there. All right. Well, Fritz, I want to thank you for your call. Please keep listening and... Uh well, Thanks to Bert, because Bert could be in who's on, who's on tonight. Okay. Thank well, you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bob, Gene, when will this new video uh, that you're working on be I don't know. The, the, the special effects, actually, there's a lot of things going on. They're doing 3D imaging to actually take people down for a flight down through Papoose Lake and the Papoose Mountains. Another thing that... Uh, came to light was during the course of all of this research, uh, we've got our hands on a Russian satellite photo, which has actually caught a flying disc. You took the, the words out of my mouth, Gene. Right. I was going to ask you about They that. caught a flying disc in the air about five months before Bob Lazar started out at S4, and uh, that will be featured in the upcoming Lazar tape. So the problem is, I don't know, Bob, would you guess an estimated date would be about six months from now? The, the computer graphics are taking for, I don't know, forever. And so I would say sometime in 1994, but it'll be well worth the wait. Well, now, this satellite photo this, this, uh, that you mentioned, Gene, this, uh, of course, is a tremendous, if, if this is verified, this is a tremendous oh, it is. thing. It's, uh, uh, it's amazing. Do you think that's one of the reasons that uh, suddenly back in 1989 the Soviets wanted to play ball with us? Right. Well, there's a lot of strange things. For instance, one thing, this again, this was uh, a satellite photo which was taken during daylight hours five months before Bob Lazar started. And five months later when Bob Lazar starts, now they're not testing during the day, they're testing at night. Now it's possible, and now this was with a high resolution satellite. There are, there are many more satellite photos, but these were high resolution. And... Uh, so it looks like they may have switched to night testing just to avoid Russian satellite photos catching any discs in the air. Well, I'm sure that they will, would also know when the Soviet satellites were overhead. Right. And, uh, well, they, they had other problems, though, as far as testing. When you're, when you're testing at, uh, at S4, you also not only have the problem of hiding from the general public, uh, you have to hide from the people who work at Area 51. And certainly this particular daytime photo was taken on a Sunday, and uh, at which time most people who generally work at Area 51 would have been home and not there. So it's it's uh, it's a uh, it's a question uh, as uh, as to why they switched from daylight testing to nighttime testing. Another uh, curious thing was we have a list of all the available Russian satellite photos, and uh, they only took a couple of high resolution photos in 1988, and they they took a few at the beginning of 1989. And then Bob Lazar went on the uh, television in silhouette as Dennis in May of 1989. And lo and behold, in, uh, in uh, July of 89, the Russian high-resolution satellite photos started bombarding the area with photos as though we had someone hostage down there. So uh, I don't know if it's a coincidence or maybe Bob Lazar was a contributory factor as to why they uh, honed in with the high-resolution satellite on Area S4. Well, you know, when, when I started this program tonight, I knew this was going to happen. Uh, we get into something, and it's, it's really tough to, to stop, but we've got to stop for a moment, do a couple of ads, so if you guys okay. could hang on once again, please. And when we come back, we're gonna, uh, we get into something, and it's, it's really tough to, to stop, but we've got to stop for a moment, do a couple of ads, so if you guys okay. could hang on once again, please. And when we come back, we're going to take some more phone calls. I and now, back to this classic and second interview I did with Robert Lazar and Mr. Gene Huff on my old show, UFOs Tonight. You are listening to Dark Matters Radio, heard exclusively on Cyberstation USA. We are back. Gentlemen, these phone lines have lit up across the board. Let's take another. Let's take a couple of more calls. We've got Kathy in Ventura County on Century. Good evening, Kathy. Hey, Don. How's it going? Very good, thank you. I haven't talked in a while. Uh, I have a couple of questions, real fast. First, to Dean. Actually, more of information for Dean. I work for the Internal Revenue Service, Dean. And the letter you received regarding that identification number for the. Uh, I can barely hear you. Could you speak up a little bit? Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. I work for the IRS. Uh huh. And the letter that they sent you saying there was no such number for that department or, or group you were looking for, uh -huh. 
was probably uh, just to throw you off the track because those are valid numbers. They have to be kept for the organization whenever any kind of tax papers are filed for their employees. And they're usually kept on tape in Martinsburg, Virginia. Can you help track them down? I can sure try if I can get a copy of the number from you. Uh, we can certainly arrange that. Okay. Uh, I'll talk to Don during the day sometime this week, and we'll see what we can set up on that. Then. Okay, we'll do it. Okay. Would okay. you like me to have her get in touch with Eugene at your office? Sure. Yeah, Just get her number off the air. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll help give, me, give me a call, Kathy. You've okay. got my number. Okay, and then to Bob Lazar, it's an honor and a pleasure to talk to you. I've been waiting to hear about you for a long time on here. Uh, one quick question. In July, my husband and I went to Area 51 on vacation. And while we were sitting out there on a Tuesday evening, around 8.30, quarter of a nine in the evening, we started hearing this tremendous roaring vibration in the air. The ground was trembling like there was an earthquake, but it wasn't an earthquake. It was like a really large engine was firing up. And then this enormous light shot up into the air for a few seconds, and then it just took off like it was like watching the Enterprise on Star Trek. You know, it was gone. You know if that was the Aurora Band camp? Yeah, supposedly that was. I did hear that one time when I was out there, and uh, that was the word. That was the first time I heard Aurora mention. Uh, that was uh, a, it. Was a tremendous noise. It just about knocked us off our feet. When Bob first described that noise, he told me it sounded like one continuous explosion that never stopped. Yeah, it was. It was really bizarre. It would just feel. And you could just feel the vibration knocking against you in the air while you're standing there. And then I did also see a disc in broad daylight there as we were driving to Area 51 at 1.30 in the afternoon. It was real fascinating. So. <laughs> well, what we're talking about here is, is something that the Air Force claims uh, is not in existence. Huh? Is that right? Right. Gene? Yeah, I, I understand that uh, uh, the government investigator trying to find the money trail on Project Aurora can, cannot find any money uh, that the uh, normal chain of command, including Black Project, is appropriating for anything called Aurora. And uh, even though a lot of people have heard the engine being tested and, and a lot of people in the military claim it exists, uh, they cannot find the money trail for it. Have they tried by uh, looking under the name of Project Senior Citizen by any chance? I didn't hear you. Project Senior Project Citizen. Senior Citizen. Uh, I don't know, really. I'm not familiar with that. And there's uh, another one also they might be using. It's Project Delta. Um, maybe, I don't know, I'm certainly no authority on that, I don't know. Okay, Kathy, I want to thank you for your call and keep those eyes to the sky. Okay, I sure will. I'll be giving you a call this week, Don, about that number. Very good. Okay, okay. thanks a okay. Bye-bye. Okay, now we are at the top of the hour. We've got to take that top of the hour break. When we come back, more of this fascinating classic interview with Bob Lazar and Gene Huff. And a whole lot more coming up, so stick around. And now back to this classic interview with Bob Lazar and Gene Huff on UFOs Tonight. This is Dark Matters Radio, heard exclusively on Cyber Station USA. Bye-bye. Okay, Bob, you, you've had a suspicion for some time that some of these projects may, in fact, have been receiving money from SDI. Mm-hmm. Do you give any credence to the uh, possibility that, that many people in the UFO field have presumed for a long time that SDI was never geared toward the Soviets, but may have been geared toward uh, um, uh, threat off-world? No. You don't give that any credence? No. Okay, you're aware... Yeah, nor do I give people in the UFO community any credence either. Well, there are some people in the UFO field, however, that, that are legitimate, sincere researchers. Uh, well... Hey, let's I'm, sure, I'm sure one day one of them will surface somewhere. You know, Don, You're talking to one, pal. Don, but, but from Bob's perspective, as far as, as people coming up with information, really, you know, Bob understands the technology, and certainly of all people, he believes what he has stated. And, and quite frankly, I think the big rub here is that some people still either have the belief or at least the hope that we would be a valid adversary for someone who's in control of space-time distortion, and Bob and me and a lot of other people just can't, possibly conceive how that could be true. Well, you know, <clears throat> this, this is a field that it has, it generates many more questions than it has ever generated answers. And people have been looking for, uh, I guess the best term is an insider for years that could come forward and break this, this uh, shield of silence that has surrounded this project. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind that the phenomenon is real, and it's a matter of making our elected representatives and officials sit up and not only acknowledge that fact, but to come clean with what the government does know. Uh, I think it's only fair for the American public who are footing the bills. Now, unfortunately, there is no college where somebody goes to school 
to become a UFO researcher. Uh, unfortunately, anybody can hang that on their on their name, and a lot of very questionable pe questionable people have done it. But it's not fair uh, to lump every investigator into that field, Bob. Well, yeah, it, it may not be fair, but well, I think he, Don. I actually think he said. I think what he means is that he doubts that any UFO researcher would have any valid reason to suggest that FBI could be employed to ward off an alien attack because it would be a useless weapon. So therefore, how could they possibly be know what they're talking about? Well, one of, yeah, one of the things that, that even made me ask that question was the fact that President Ronald Reagan made reference to alien threats no less than at least five times during public speeches. And he used that, he used that analogy uh, a number of times when the Soviet Union and the United States was trying to uh, reach some type of an accord to lower the tensions. You know, you know, on that note, it is very possible that Ronald Reagan was sold a bill of goods. There's a pretty new book out called Teller's War, in which uh, the author, uh, you can get it from Science, Science News, I think, right now, uh, in which they document how Dr. Edward Teller misinformed the presidents as well as the entire chain of command about FBI, and it's a new book called Teller's War. And so it is very possible that a guy like Reagan and even Henry Kissinger and people like that could have been could have been told that FBI could be valid for something like that when indeed it wasn't true. Even if Edward Teller knew it wasn't true, he overstated the case so they could solicit the, the funding. And of course, that's what it all comes down to, Bucks. Guys, we're right at the top of the hour. We've got to take another half-hour break. Please hang on, and when we come back, more with my guest this evening, Mr. Robert Lazar, Mr. Gene Huff, and yours truly, Don Ecker, UFOs Tonight. Hi, okay, this is Don. That was all the relevant uh, interview from that particular session with Bob Lazar and Gene Hupp, which took place on October the 24th, 1993. Now, the next year, I had Huff on the show once again in uh, 1994, and uh, that was also a fascinating interview. So, now we're going to switch to Gene Hupp and uh, let's see what was happening at that time. You're listening right here at Dark Matters Radio on Cyberstation USA. Oh, one more thing. Just so you know, that evening in question with Gene Huff, I was joined in studio by my then co-host, Mr. Dwight Schultz, star of Stage and Screen. You probably best knew Dwight from the A-Team or Star Trek. The A-Team, he played Howling Mad Murdoch, that crazy helicopter pilot, and on Star Trek, he was Lieutenant Barkley. Now, we were talking about a recently televised Larry King special from Rachel, Nevada, and the subject of Bob Lazar came up, so... Listen to what Larry King had to say first. If you've been a, a listener of this program for the last several years, you know that Lazar has been on UFOs tonight several times. If you haven't been, or possibly if you've been to, been out to, of town to Venus or living in a cave, Bob Lazar claims that uh, back in 1988-1989 he was employed on an ultra-top secret project at a place even more secret than Area 51, also, although it's not uh, that far from Area 51, a place called S4. And being a physicist, he claims to, to be a physicist, he was working, attempting to back-engineer an alien propulsion unit on a spaceship, or an alien spaceship, a UFO. Now, if you missed the Larry King program, Stanton Friedman addressed that. And we're going to play that excerpt from the Larry King Live special right now, so hold on. We have in front of us a UFO model, if we can show that on. It's from the Tester Corporation. We discussed Bob Lazar in that earlier package. This is based on Bob Lazar's, was built based on Bob Lazar's description of the craft that he says he saw at Area 51. 
Well, Larry, it's, it's important to recognize here that there are two separate questions with regard to the model. A, whether there are vehicles of that sort out of the, at Area 51. B, whether Bob Lazar is telling the truth. I've done an enormous amount of research, and I find that nothing checks out. He isn't a scientist. He didn't go to MIT. He didn't go to Caltech. He didn't work for Los Alamos. Worked there for a while as a technician, apparently. He's a liar? Yes. So I say you don't believe probably. this is there? Uh, that's a separate question. You may have heard stories about something just like that. I certainly don't believe his reconstruction of the means of propulsion. He's got a nice story. It's good science fiction, but as a nuclear physicist, and I've worked on nuclear rockets and fusion rockets and such, the story doesn't hold together when you look at it critically. Now, there's some separate... science you know. Yes. Okay, you heard it. That was Stanton Friedman talking to Larry King, and according to Stanton Friedman... Bob Lazar is not telling the truth. Well, tonight, joining us from Las Vegas, Nevada, is Mr. Gene Huff. You've heard Gene here on this program before. Gene is a very close friend and confidant of Bob Lazar. has been with him for years. They, they were neighbors. Uh, Huff knew Lazar before Lazar went to work at this exotic location, if in fact he did. Uh, Lazar, tonight, was not able to join the show uh, Gene can tell you why he was out of town, but I would like to take this opportunity to welcome Gene Huff to the program. Gene, good evening. How are you doing, Don? I'm very well. Did you hear the uh, the segment that we pulled from the Larry King special? <laughs> yes, I, I don't think there's anyone in the country interested in UFOs that hasn't heard that segment. Okay, well, Gene, the reason I wanted to bring you on board tonight, uh, you know I called you up right after the show right. at the beginning of the week, to find out if you and Lazar could come on. Uh, first off, let me ask you this: How did Lazar? Uh, how did he feel about this? About this remark? Uh, well, what, what was curious about this whole scenario is Bob was asked to be on the Larry King live show uh, on TNT, I guess it was, but he had already agreed to do the Unsolved Mysteries a few weeks prior to that and uh, turned them down. But it was an it was an amiable situation. They said, well, you know, maybe we'll do a Larry King Live another time. So uh, we were contacted by Carrie Stevenson, the lady that produced that segment, uh, for a picture of Lazar that they could show on screen. And, and uh, I told her that with Stanton Friedman, uh, I had never heard of Greer. I knew of Randall from, uh, you know, just the Roswell book. It sounded like it was going to be a Bob Lazar assassination. <laughs> and at that point, we offered George Knapp, uh, I, I, you know, had George okay that ahead of time and said George would uh, gladly be on the panel since Bob couldn't do it. And George, as, as I would imagine you would agree, is probably the foremost media liaison with the Area 51 story and just things, UFO things in general in Nevada. Well, I couldn't understand why they didn't have NASA. They said on. at that point in time, they said their two hours was full and they didn't have room. However, subsequent to that, they included Glenn Campbell on the panel, and I don't know, uh, the bottom line is Larry King asked the question, what do you, to each of those individuals, what do you feel is going on at Area 51, and I don't think that Greer or Randall uh, or Stanton Friedman, for that matter, any of those people necessarily consider themselves an authority on Area 51, so the, the makeup of the panel was curious, uh, the bottom line to Stanton Friedman's commentary, first of all, Stanton Friedman hasn't done much research into the Lazar story. Most of the things he actually knows were handed to him by George Knapp and myself. Uh, Stan Friedman brings up the point as though it's poignant. Oh, Bob Lazar worked uh, at Los Alamos, not for Los Alamos. Well, we told him that, that Bob was hired by a, a subcontractor called Kirk Meyer, and uh, he worked at the Maison Physics Facility. It's the same way here in Nevada. People work at the Nevada test site, not for the Nevada test site. If you work for EG&G as a physicist, you're, you're, you have no less credentials than if you worked for, you know, the Department of Energy. And so uh, we laid that in his lap. But uh, I, first of all, I'd like to say that, you know, anyone would be lying if they said that Stan Friedman have, had never done anything that was productive for ufology. He has. He went to bat back in the 70s against stiff opposition, and, and, and he has produced. But I really think at this point in time, and uh, he has the attitude, and I'm sure you of all people have seen it before, he does not a allow any story in ufology to move forward unless he puts his seal of approval on it. And 
So the bottom line is, here is a Larry King Live with a questionable panel out at Area 51. Well, why are they at Area 51? Why is the Little Alien so popular now? If you trace it back, even though there are other contributory factors, you trace it to Bob Lazar. There's the tester model sitting on the desk. And, and even though there were efforts made to produce that by Jan, John Andrews from Tester Corporation, the reason there is a tester model is because of Bob Lazar. Well, Gene, where, where is Lazar tonight? How come he's not, uh, he's not with you? He had to go to Los Alamos. He's in Los yeah. Alamos. He still, uh, he still has a contract under a corporate name to repair uh, alpha radiation detectors for Los Alamos National Lab. Okay. Uh, does he plan on addressing this, this statement by Friedman? Well, he, uh, he, he does. In, in fact, uh, Carrie Stevenson, the producer of that Larry King segment, I, I tried to contact her this week to say, well, you know, I told you that was in a Lazar assassination. Why don't we go ahead and uh, try and get a Larry King live with George Knapp and Bob Lazar? I got Knapp to agree to it and Lazar to agree to it. But Larry King live had uh, tied up that uh, interview with Marlon Brando last night, and she was still in California and won't be back into Washington, D.C., until Monday, but yeah, Monday morning we're going to see if maybe we can hook up Larry King live with George Knapp and Bob Lazar. Okay, in one minute we've got to take a take a half hour break. But okay. Before we before we take the break, I've got to ask you this question. Now Lazar has been on my program several times. Right. You've been on. Uh, you've been on even more right. than he has. I've had George Knapp on this program. The big question, Gene, and this is a question that that could have been answered five years ago. Lazar, and you'll be the first to admit it, is not the easiest guy to get along with. Right. He came out with this story about Area uh, 51 S4. He's talked about what he claimed to have seen out there, working out there. Uh, he gave us his credentials. Why can he not produce uh, some documentation to prove his academic background? Now, I don't want you to answer that right now okay. because we've got to take the break. We're at the half hour. But when we come back, Let's take a look at that. Okay, we're back, and we're going to go back to Gene. Gene, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, have you thought about that question? Right, and I guess the question is, why doesn't Lazar assist more in establishing his uh, background? Right, and why, why doesn't, I mean, you know, you have to tell yourself, now here's somebody that came out literally, and I was there when it happened. He galvanized, literally, worldwide, he galvanized. Uh, UFO researchers, people interested in the subject. I mean, uh, Gene, and you've told me how many times people from all over the planet have tried for years to get in touch with him. Right. Uh, and and yet Bob has shown, Lazar has shown absolutely no interest. Uh, you, you've got to admit yourself that, you know, that most people would not accept that. You can't come forward, do a half step, and then, and then just back away from it. Right, and I understand some people's apprehension to the story, and there are a million contributory reasons. But if we go back to the beginning, um, you know, Lazar, this isn't a scenario that, that, uh, that he fabricated. He, he was sincere from the beginning. A lot of people didn't believe him. When he first came out, he said the reason he went public, you know, originally with George Knapp on television here in Las Vegas, was to protect himself. It wasn't uh, you know, even though a lot of people... There was nothing altruistic about it. He was simply out for self-preservation. Right, and, and, but most people refuse to believe that. They go, well, there must have been a piece of him that wanted to expose this. And I guess there was a small part of him that thought it was unfair that, you know, the government wouldn't come clean about the fact that there was life here, or that there was residual evidence that there was life here from elsewhere. But uh, he did do it for selfish reasons, to protect himself and not to necessarily throw anyone a bone and he didn't feel that he owed anyone anything. Now, this isn't my opinion. That's not necessarily the way I would handle it, but this is the way he looked at it. Right. And we also have to look at other, other things. By the way, a long time ago when, when questions came up, and I mean four or five years ago when questions came up about his credentials, I told him, I said, look, Bob, if you've overstated your credentials, why don't you tell me now so we can help clear this thing up? Because I st even if he, I found out... He, he didn't go to MIT. I still believe he worked at S4 for, because I was around when all of this happened. And I told him this was too big of a story, you, you know, to be made shady by virtue of the fact that there were, was this, this information floating around about his credentials. And he told me, no, that uh, he did have the degrees. The, the reason that he's not in any 
yearbooks or anything at MIT is that he only took a course or two there and petitioned for a diploma, and uh, they didn't want to give him one, but more or less he manipulated them into it. I, I guess some universities retain a right of residency that they don't have to give you a diploma from there unless you've uh, gone there and resided there and taken X amount of courses there. So no one will ever find his, his picture in, in a yearbook at MIT. And, but there's other contributory information. In fact, one, one thing you and I discussed on the phone this past week, and everyone's fam or most people are familiar with the famous 1982 front page article on Bob Lazar and his jet car that was in the Los Alamos Monitor, and which was actually the reason he met and spoke with Dr. Edward Teller, which years later resulted in him in, in him getting the job at S4. But in this article, uh, for, now the Los Alamos Monitor is just the main newspaper in Los Alamos, which is a, very small town that is totally, almost totally employed by the Los Alamos National Laboratory. There might be a hundred or less jobs in, uh, in uh, you know, support services, restaurants, doctors, things like that. But it's essentially uh, the, the substance of the town is the lab. And now here the newspaper is a front page story saying, here's Bob Lazar, a physicist who works at the Maison Physics Facility, and here's his jet car. Now, the point here is that do you think if Bob Lazar wasn't a physicist, he was some lowly technician, what kind of an uprising do you think it would cause in a town like Los Alamos if he claimed to be a physicist on the front page of that newspaper? Yet no one said a word. And uh, this is because the people who worked with him at the Maison Physics facility considered him a physicist also. And this goes back to the Stanton Friedman comment, uh, really for, for Stanton Friedman to claim that he has done an in-depth background investigation of Bob Lazar uh, is untrue. For Stanton Friedman to say that he has, uh, that he's examined Lazar's explanation of the propulsion system, he, and he knows that is untrue. Quite frankly, in this instance, Stanton Friedman is a liar. Certainly, if someone who actually worked on a disc would tell me that, that Bob had jumbled the physics, I could believe it. There, uh, we've, we've had great input from other physicists and scientists around the world and Lazar's explanation has enlightened them and caused them to do further research. I think to go on a, a national television program like Stanton Friedman did really uh, exposes a side of him a lot of people haven't seen, and that is the fact that the Lazar story has moved things forward, has opened up some minds, has caused the tester model, and there's a little, there's a little jealousy going on there. Gene, Gene uh, this is Dwight Schultz. We yes. haven't met. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Uh -huh. I've listened to you many times, and I've... Um I've been following Bob Lazar for, for many years since, mm -hmm. since he first uh, appeared on the scene. I've seen the tape. And um, you just brought up, uh, uh, you just said a few things that weren't quite accurate about what Friedman said. Friedman said the physics were a lie, basically, mm -hmm. which is an interesting area uh, for dispute because the physics is something that, if it is a lie, it's a lie. If it's not a lie, it's not a lie. And this is something that Bob Lazar, and I, and I, and I, I am positive that Bob Lazar is a physicist. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have any doubts about that. But he, he this, is, this is an area, where, uh, an arena, where Friedman and Lazar could butt heads, and there is no question. Um, there would be no question here. Uh, now, my question to you, has Lazar ever appeared with another physicist to discuss his theories? On a radio, a national program? No, no, I don't think, not in public he has. And so, so which physicists have you contacted, or, or which physicists have contacted most, you to support Bob Lazar's contentions? The most contentions? recent one was a uh, physicist from Germany. What's his name? Oddly enough. Uh, I don't even have these letters here in front of me. I Well, would Bob appear with them. a physicist? I saw, oh, no. I saw the letters. No, but right. would, would Bob appear with a physicist? Because I, I think uh, his theories, I mean, I, I have... Uh, I, I've talked to some people about his ideas and thrown the ideas out to some physicists, and I didn't see anybody basically said, say, that sounds like bunk. By the way, I think a couple of years ago, Bob did do a radio show from that Hieronymus and Company back in Maryland, East, where uh, Bruce Maccabee, I think, was on there, and a couple of other guys. He did do a radio show one time. but And, and he's certainly not opposed to discussing physics, but... Uh, you said, you know, there, you know, Stanton Friedman could discuss it. Well, uh, on what basis? I, I mean, I'm with Well, you. particle physics can be discussed by anybody who understands particle physics because there is, I mean, to quantum, quantum mechanics and particle theory is fixed to an extent. So there's, uh, uh, it, it's a, there is an, a body of knowledge that is there that can be discussed. And 
people who are uh, are versed in the subject can can translate that for the for the layman. So that I mean, no, I thought Bob Lazar did an excellent job of explaining mm -hmm. his cons uh, what what was going on in that flying saucer right. and that propulsion unit on that tape. Now, it, I I think that if if Stanton Friedman says that physics is phony, then he can try to do a very good job of exposing it. And if he can't, you see, if the physics is correct. And Stan Friedman can't. He's got to eat he crow. He has gone way out on a limb here. And I think because there are a lot of people waiting for Bob Lazar to actually come out and, 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 and show that he stands tall with another physicist. Right. I think it would be an, an, a, 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 a great credit. There would be a lot of credibility to him right. saying, yes, I will. I will cause I, and, and I've heard him talk to people who are, who are very well versed, and he does stand his own. So I don't see why he shouldn't take this head on, because this was a, this was a pretty heavy-duty charge of Friedman's. Right. Well, but... But what you're saying is true, yet it's a gray area also. For instance, what Bob Lazar learned it as for is that some of the directions mainstream physicists are moving and areas they're researching are the wrong direction, and they're actually butting their head against the wall. You have to remember, remember a lot of the evidence, a lot of the proof of particle physics is residual proof, and there's a gray area here where even in the mainstream uh, you know, science community, be it no one, if you, if you ask 10 mainstream physicists what is gravity, I'm certainly you're not insinuating that they would all give you the same answer. Well, and that's what Einstein's theory is all about. And it's pretty well proven. It's proven as what? That's what, that's what Einstein's theory of relativity did. That's, he revolutionized physics right. because he explained what gravity was. That's, that's it. Well, but he, you know, he didn't explain whether it was a, gra whether it was a wave, whether it was a combination of wave and gravity waves particles. have never no no gra you're right gravity waves have never been discovered but right. he he his theory was an explanation of what gravity was what bob lazar has done is gone into a particle and has said here's that, where you get it well no you, where there is a certain kind of electromagnetic force that can be amplified right well I un by the way i understand the tape i wrote the tape well so. i I'm, I'm not saying you don't understand right. the tape i'm saying i'm just a lay person and, and i watched it and i found it intriguing what i am saying is that i think that it, it does stand it should stand this test of scrutiny and I think that Friedman, having called Lazar a liar on national television, I think Lazar, I would, it, would, it would be to the benefit of everyone for him to prove that test of scrutiny. And I think that Friedman, having called Lazar a liar on national television, I think Lazar, I would, it, would, it would be to the benefit of everyone for him to prove that Stanton Friedman doesn't know where his hat is. Well, uh... Stanton Friedman has to go on the record with what he thinks, then, doesn't he? No, I think, well, he said the physics Bob is Lazar phony. Bob is on the that, record. That, he's on the record. He's saying the physics is phony, and I think what he's done is challenged. Well, it's, he, it's challenged. Well, that, well, Bob Lazar is on the record as saying what, what his version of the physics is. I think it's up to Stanton Friedman now. Well, what you're saying is you, you don't think that this is going to happen. Okay. Well, what I'm saying <laughs> is that you, you, you are presuming there are some cut-and-dried arguments, and there aren't. I mean, well, look, the biggest factor of all the interstellar travel is to what degree space-time can be distorted, right? I mean, we know gravitational no, we don't fields know distort space-time. No, we don't know that. That's wait, the wait. problem. This we is what Bob Lazar said. We do know gravitational fields distort space and time. We know that space is curved. That's no, what we wait, know. Wait, we know no. that's what's... No, no, listen. No, 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 no. Bob is the one who has to prove this. No, wait. Mainstream physicists, and call one up and ask them, no, they know. That gravity distorts space. And yes, time. it's that it distorts space. We, yes, that's but who what we knows know. that it can be distorted to the degree that Bob Lazar declares it can be distorted to? Would be the argument. Be, uh, no, but the argument would be the particle physics that he explains on that tape. Is it possible? Is it? Does it? Does it? It does, it, does it follow the laws that we know now? Even if we just extend them. In other words, does it make sense? Uh, another physicist has said it doesn't make sense, and I'm just saying it, it makes for very interesting television uh, to, to, uh, to, or, or radio to put two people together and say, to, to hear one person's story, then to hear the other person's story. And I think Lazar can certainly stand his, stand his own, and, and since I have never seen him debate this subject, yet he has compiled and, and, and has produced quite, uh, quite a, a, a video on this subject. He's going to quite, uh, you, you, both of you, have gone to great uh, gr uh, a great deal of work to produce that video. It's very complex and it's it's very well produced. Well, I think 
that like anything that's well produced, it needs to stand a little scrutiny. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why you can't go head to head with somebody who has said it's a, it, it's a lot of hooey. Well, quite frankly, he I have never heard Stan Friedman declare that it was a lot of hooey until last week. In other words, I've heard I him, haven't either. I've heard him, you know, have reservations about Bob Lazar's credentials and. Uh, he used to always say Bob Lazar was in his gray basket. Uh, actually, last week was the first time I saw him made that make well, that. Well, and that's what I and you understand. I'm not calling Bob. A, a, oh, I understand. A I'm saying I am a layperson here, and now I have one person who claims to be a physicist, another person claims to be a physicist, and I don't I don't know any of their credentials really. Well, and, let's and, we're, and we're, let's, let's get them together. We've got some phone calls that are sitting here patiently waiting. I want to I want to get into those, okay. uh, Gene. And then we we've got a lot of ground to cover to make. We're going to go to Ralph who's calling from Escondido on Dimension. Good evening, Ralph. Yes, hi, how are you doing? Fine. How are you doing, Ralph? Ah, fine. Uh, do I, with the 8th Air Force Historical Society met the day, and I did get some leads on, on that material that I was going to research. It was a really good show. On the Foo Fighters? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, that I think Dwight's uh, point was a very good one. That the, the, the test here is the test of physics, and, and if I were a moderator, this is, this is what I would ask uh, Lazar and the panel of physicists. Number one, how was the gravity wave measured that he purports is the, is the motive force of this uh, vehicle. And number two, he uh, states that he has, has had in his possession this material 115, or Lazarium 115. How did he determine the atomic weight and number of that material? Did you catch all that, Gene? Yeah, and, and what... Well, you know, he individually didn't determine that. They determined it at the S4... And I, if I remember right, I think they did some of the analysis at Los Alamos also, the spectral analysis and, and whatever the things uh, physicists do to identify, uh, uh, to identify heavy elements, really, I don't know. I'm not a scientist. I, you know, I don't even know how uh, in, in this past week's science news they were, uh, uh, they were talking about uh, creating new heavy isotopes at national labs. And when they create an isotope, I really... I re, you know, considering the scale we're talking about, it's difficult to keep in mind the scale of particle physics. I don't even know how they determine if you've got an isotope of element 107, uh, much less 115. So well, you uh, measure the atomic weight, but they, but but they, there there are physicists that have, in fact, uh, beside Bob Lazar, who who have now and been published in Discover Magazine, they have come forward and said these elements do exist, and they seem to be as Lazar described them. Uh, well, that's, that's, so that's part of the article in Science News in the past week that these isotopes of the heavier elements which we synthesize at laboratories actually are showing a longer half-life. Instead of decaying instantaneously, they last between 10 and 30 seconds, which doesn't seem like much, but it seems like they're at the advent of the island of stability. But, but you know, the thing that is frustrating for me as someone who has followed this field is that this... If someone comes on and says what somebody is saying in science is it, it, it's it's phony, it doesn't work out. And here you have somebody with an extraordinary claim, and the meeting of these two people seems to be as elusive as UFOs themselves. I don't. It seems like I'm never going to be satisfied. I'm never going to see him stand up. Somebody that who who has made incredible claims and who astounded me and who I I thought was very believable. I. I have this gut-wrenching feeling that I am never going to see him sit down on a radio program or on a television program and answer another bona fide physicist who is a, physicist who is a hell of a lot smarter than I am, asking him really pertinent, pointed questions about what he, what, what he has presented as true. And, and somehow this, this, this inability to, to get people to answer questions, right? it's, just, it's, it's frustrating, not just for me, but for everybody who supports this field. Yet, yet a couple of years ago, as I stated before, he did go on a radio show with Bruce Maccabee and was another Dr. John Brandenberger or something like that. But Bruce Maccabee is an advocate. And you're saying... He's, I'm saying here's well, somebody who's Maccabee saying wasn't it's wrong. Really an advocate. No, he, well, he is an advocate. And, and you, here, is, here, here is someone who is saying it's not right. The physics are not right. And I think if if Bob and I, he should come forward and say yes, it is right, Stanton. Well, if and let me sh let me explain to you why you don't understand if it. If Stanton Friedman puts his apprehensions on the record, I I would believe Bob Lazar would do that. As far as them meeting on a radio show, I think Bob Lazar at this point would would be more apt to meet with someone else and not give Stanton Friedman the airtime. <laughs> well, Even if it was another adversary. Well, that's a good. That's a good point. I mean, uh, I, I, let's see if he'll but follow if through Friedman with that. But if Friedman goes on the record, I'm certain Bob will address 
his apprehensions and claims. But also keep in mind that physicists in both directions, both pro and con, can ask and answer questions. Uh, you know, there are so many gray areas there. Someone cre can create another dimension, and, and you can't win an argument where, uh, where someone is creating other you, dimensions. And, uh, so, okay, you know, Gene, we're at, the, uh, we're at the time where we're going to have to take a quick break. Uh, Ralph, I'm going to leave you. I'm going to put you on hold also uh, to finish up when we come back, okay? Okay, fine. Uh, so if all you folks will just stand by, there's a lot more coming tonight. My name is Don Ecker. The show is UFOs tonight. You're in Las Vegas, Nevada, Mr. Gene Huff. Gene? Yes. yes. Back again. Right. Okay, and we're going to finish up with Ralph from Escondido. Ralph, uh, did you have anything else? Because we've got to move along. Uh, well, I think that if he answer, gives a direct answer to those two questions, it would go a long way to clearing it up. And, uh, Don, you had said that you had seen an interview with Teller in which Teller at least declined to verify the story. That is correct. As a matter of fact, Gene has that uh, That's entire video. that entire video. Gene, you wanna you wanna go ahead and tell them that I'm, I'll verify all this. Because uh, it was uh, some some telejournalist from Florida had interviewed Teller, and uh, they asked him. Uh, it was interesting. They asked Teller, "Have you ever heard of a man named Bob Lazar?" And instantly, Teller said, "No, I don't believe I've ever heard the name." which was the quickest check of 80-year-old memory banks I've ever seen. If, if anyone asked any of us, do you know uh, Joe Smith, you'd have to say, well, uh, what period of my life or where do I know him from to try and ring a bell? Teller instantaneously said, no, I don't believe I've ever heard the name. They gave him a picture of Bob Lazar. He studied it and said, why should I know him? And the guy said, well, he says he worked at Area 51 in Nevada. And Teller shakes his head, no, he doesn't know where Area 51 is. He's never heard of Area 51. And the, the conversation goes on, and eventually Teller finally says, look, uh, I, I probably met him. Uh, I may have told somebody that I liked him after I met him and if I liked him, uh, but I just don't remember him, and why should I go on camera saying I do? Who the hell cares? That's what, uh, <laughs> that's what Teller said. Okay, well, thank you very much. Okay, Ralph, thank Bye. you. By the way... Yes, Just to end up on that topic, um, the Bob Lazar is not adverse to any of these things. If he's got any apprehensions, it is when Lazar came out, he admitted he doesn't have all of the answers. He can't take the, the, the case to court. In fact, his original apprehension was the fact that since he is from the scientist, scientific community, he knows how scientists think. He knows what their apprehensions will be. He knows he can't prove it to them. So he's not afraid of the argument he already knows what the culmination of the argument will be which prevents him from wanting to get into it to begin with gene just a couple of nights ago on abc television on prime time with sam donaldson i saw a segment on that mainstream news program that literally shocked me and for for all you folks out there listening to uh, to this program tonight if you have if you missed this uh... I feel horrible for you because this was one of the most telling news segments on, on this subject I have ever seen. ABC sent a crew to the former Soviet Union, to Russia, and basically, uh, Gene retraced all of George Knapp's steps and interviewed people that Knapp, that, uh, that I saw the interviews a year ago. Uh, people like this uh, former Soviet Colonel Sokolov, who headed up their UFO investigation for the Soviet military, right. and talked about some of the cases, including a UFO flying in over a Soviet nuclear base and lighting up the control panels. And I didn't see Sam Donaldson sneer once. Uh, what do you hear down there in Vegas about this? Because I know that you've been in touch with them. Uh what I hear is actually the corroboration of all of this by the Russians, and I, I don't know why, because there could uh, you know, be uh, Bill Coopers and John Lears in Russia, too. I, I don't know why just because it's Russian they believe it, but for some reason the corroboration of these events, which are similar to events which you know, you've been reporting for years and years, and, uh, as well as other people, have uh, made people sit up and pay attention. I guess they thought only Americans could fabricate stories, and that if uh, foreigners uh, corroborate the story, that there's uh, more of uh, more strength to the truth of the matter. However, an interesting slant on that is George Knapp did all of that, and uh, actually they were going to do a similar story on CBS before this, and uh, they essentially get in contact with George Knapp and try and get direction from him and get all of his information. 
and then cut him out. And he attributes this to the fact that journalists, for instance, it's the same reason... Cut he, Knapp out? Right. It's the same reason uh, he, um, he wasn't asked... This is what George Knapp contends, that probably the reason he wasn't on Larry King Live, probably he's not on many of these other programs that are now addressing some of the information he got in Russia, is that journalists, like their egos, make them want to be the one to expose the story, and they don't like to uh, have... A, another journalist as a guest. For instance, Sam Donaldson wants to break the story. He doesn't want to say, here, George Knapp broke the story, and here's what he's got to say. And uh, so Knapp says this, uh, you know, he's beating his head against the wall. They, they will call and get information from him for months at a time, and they won't even pay him for the long-distance phone call. Ah, uh, don't you love it? <laughs> yeah. Sounds like Hollywood. Yeah. Hey, look, we're at the top of the hour. We have got to take that top of the hour break. Let's go back to Gene. Gene, we've got... Uh, a bunch of people on hold here. Let's okay. let's go through some of these phone calls real quick. We've got Jim, who's one of our faithful listeners, calling us from Eagle Rock on Century Cable. Good evening, Jim. How are you? Um, fine. How about yourself? Okay. Hi, Dwight. Hi. How you doing? Uh, can I have two things? To, um, there is something that was mentioned on last week's show, and I couldn't get in to save my name. But the one guy called up and said on the 25th anniversary moon show um, that uh, there was a gentleman, that being me, that had called in a report that the Apollo 16 crew had sent ahead. Right, and I right. read it on the air. Yes, yes. And he said, uh, or Oakland said that was misinformation. Yes. And said that the astronauts were reporting UFOs. They did. That's not at all what it was. They were reporting domes and structures and tunnels. No UFOs, and that did come from ham radio operators. Okay, Jim. So, so that that that's true, and it's not misinformation. Well, you know, uh, I've got to tell you that they were friends of mine. You know, right? Hoagland has always been very touchy around uh, any talk about uh, unidentified flying objects in the many years that he's been associated with, especially the Mars. Cydonia question. Uh, he has characterized the UFO field as being like a ghetto. Uh, he's been uh, been very, you know, denigrating toward the subject. However, with what Hoagland is talking about, uh, the possible existence of former uh, extraterrestrial visitors to Mars, or even perhaps at one point an indigenous life, which I, I don't think that's possible on Mars, or visitors to the moon, they would have to have a way of getting there, okay? Yeah. And if, in fact, that way would be something that we would call unidentified flying objects, so be it. Uh, then there is a connection. I personally think there is. So uh, I have no doubt that uh, the story that you were talking about with the Apollo 16 thing was absolutely correct. Yes. Uh, the other thing I called, some people have, and I've heard this on your show, have flown up to Area 51 and they moved it somewhere. Or they couldn't find anything or something and they moved it to some other base or... You yeah. can't you can't fly over to Area 51 for one thing, it's restricted airspace. Right, so, but yeah. Knapp, Knapp was talking about believing, uh, I believe it was Bill Bray that was out around S4, Gene, or right. where S4 was reported to have been. Uh, and according to Bill Bray, that entire area was was uh, cleaned out. Mm -hmm. uh, Gene, let me ask you something. I Bill Bray was on the King Show mm -hmm. last week, and I found his attitude extraordinarily questionable. The guy is a representative, a United States representative, right. representing the people of the state of Nevada. Am I correct? Right. I think he's on the Defense Appropriations Committee also or something. Okay. Well, Bill Bray came across as nobody has any damn business being out at this area knowing what's going on. Uh, this is a uh, government installation, and even though you, Joe Citizen and Jane Citizen, pay the bills, even though you sent me to Washington to represent your interest, even though you are actually the government, you don't have any business being out here. I, I, you know, if, if I were a, a, a native or a citizen of Nevada, 
Uh, I would have been tempted to write this guy a, a letter in the strongest terms, reminding him who the, the you know who the hell he's working but there's, for. But there's two sides to that story. He's also involved in a, in a heated debate here in Nevada about the land grab that the DOD is doing out around Area 51. What is his stance? Uh, well, quite frankly, off the record, even before they had the public hearings, he said it's a done deal. They're going to grab the, <laughs> the land, and the, the hearings were just a formality. However, I am also a believer that, uh, you know, effective national security demands that we do research and development out of plain sight. And if they are going to spend hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars to do that, uh, well, what would you do? I'll pose it to you and Dwight. If, if uh, you were a general and you had a colonel or whoever over a base where you were doing secret research and development, and they allowed anyone who can climb a hill to no, climb no, no. up there I'm, and take pictures. I'm not, but... I'm not suggesting that there is not a need for national security, right. Gene. Uh, believe me, I'm not suggesting that. If anybody knows that there is a need for national security, I do. Right. Uh, I served in the military. But, but my point is this. Let's face it. If this is a top-secret installation, it's got to be the worst-kept secret in history. Everybody knows it's out Correct. there. So why don't we just do this? If I were the government, if I were the commander of that base, if I were the person in charge, I would say, okay, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, we do have a top secret research and development facility out here. We research advanced avionics, we do this, we do that. And uh, yeah, you know, this is an unfriendly world we live in. We must have uh, a place where we can do these type of things. The reason it's secret is, in fact, for our national defense. Right. Okay? Don't lie to the American people that there's nothing out there. Don't, right. don't, no, wait a minute. Don't go out and, and, and dump all over a citizen's constitutional rights on public land. Right. Okay, and, and harass them and arrest them and so forth. I mean, let's play by the rules. You've got to have rules, Gene. Yeah, but if the, they don't play by the rules... Here's the thing is the people call Nellis or they call the Air Force and say, hey, do you have a base out there? And they say, uh, we're not aware of anything. However, as far as them admitting that there's a base there, I mean, five... When, what has it been? It's over five years ago, five and a half years ago now, when we got caught out there, they gave us a warning, and I still have it, and it says, you are approaching a military installation. Now, if that's not an admission that there's a military base there, I don't know what is. Right. I, I wonder if someone may be calling the Air Force. Maybe the Air Force doesn't run the base. Maybe it's the DOD. Maybe it's the Navy. Who knows? But if they've got the guards handing out pieces of paper saying you're approaching a military installation, they cite the Nevada revised statutes about photographic equipment and taking pictures even of the exterior of the base, I consider that an admission that there's a base there, and I think people use the fact that Nellis Air Force Base denies Area 51's existence, use it for hype, because, you know, they've been handing out printed matter for at least a half decade that I know of, admitting that there is one there. Right. Okay, we've got to move along. Jim, okay. I want to thank you for your call, Jim. Okay, Jim good night. Bye. We're going to go to Kevin, who's calling us from Ontario on Comcast. Good evening, Kevin. Thank you for holding. Good evening, gentlemen. I'm calling about uh, Larry King's special that was on. Yes. Uh, I thought it was uh, really disappointing because uh, they kept rehashing the same old stuff over and over that you guys do on the radio. <laughs> and uh, as far as that, That's Mr. What my father said. As far as that, Mr. Greer goes on TV. Uh, he kept, you know, they asked him, "Well, have you ever seen UFOs?" He said, "Oh yes, I've been a hundred feet from them, and uh, I've taken photos of them, and uh, I've taken, you know, motion pictures of them." And then somebody called us, you know, they never showed any of this. And then someone from Virginia, I think it was, called in and said, well, how come you haven't shown this on TV and brought the proof with you? And he had that kind of look like, you know, I got caught in a lie. I mean, you could see right through the guy. I thought he said that he had given one of the tapes to the producers of the Larry King show. Yeah, well, I, it, well, they, well during the show they were crying that uh, the media laughs at them and the media don't put them on. Here they had a two-hour special to, you know, bring their proof out. I, I want to say, I just want to tell you something and let Don Ecker, uh, he can, because he's really responsible for this, but they, they showed what was supposedly for the first time uh, a rocket launch and a UFO approaching the rocket. They yeah, showed, I, but let me say, let me just tell you something. I've seen the entire tape, and it's mind-blowing. They showed you twice the end of the tape and didn't show you the most extraordinary part of it. And I said, I called Don, I said, Don, I said, what was that? 
They showed nothing. And what was on this tape was this object approaching this rocket as it is moving into outer space. And this object, it circles this object, moves away, comes back, and goes off again. And the only thing that they showed you was one segment of this light, this little, little dot of light coming towards the rocket. Those producers didn't do what they could have done, which was wow you. I mean, they show, uh, which I thought Primetime Live did by showing some of the KGB yeah, well, films. You know, this, but, this is Larry but, King. He's supposed to be the guru of talk television. Well, and but you, you blamed the gentleman on the panel, and, and the not. editing and production wasn't really their well, fault. I mean, if, if I knew I was going to go on the show, and uh, I would bring proof with me, I wouldn't go on the show unless I could show what I really had, because it makes me look like a fool and a liar. Well, Kevin, Kevin they, they interviewed me for that production back in uh, early July, and I knew personally the executive producer of, of the King Show, Tom Farmer, and the guy that, that actually wrote and produced this, U, this UFO two-hour special. Uh, I gave Farmer that video, okay? I said, look, Tom, I said, this is one of the most impressive videos I have ever seen in my life. He looked at it. He agreed. He said, we'd love to use this on the show. And I said, well, that's why I showed it to you, because I think it's important that it should be gotten out there. I've had this thing for well over a year. I feel that, uh, and I've been holding it. I was holding it until I felt the right, the right program, okay, where it could really be shown to its best advantage. And as a result, they used a couple of seconds of it. I was blown away. But my point is this. I had no way of knowing how they were going to present it what remarks of mine would be used, okay, they interviewed me for over an hour, okay, and you saw what, what, what they had on the air, yeah. okay, and as a matter of fact, the way they had me featured on that, on that program, it made me look more of a debunker, okay, or, or a skeptic than somebody that's researching the phenomenon. John, I think Dwight makes a great point in that uh, there, was, there was so little time attributed to that. I mean, people, people didn't grasp the, the physics, the, the propulsion that has to be involved for the ability of something that emits light to do a 360 around a rocket. I mean, the, traveling to outer, outer space, I well, mean, that is unbelievable. The intelligence of him to say, ladies and gentlemen, you're seeing something for the first time, it's, ever, it's never been shown before, and you see nothing. I mean, it could have been anything. Right. I was, it was it, the in, intelligence behind showing that well, kind. Well, I'd like to ask Don, are you gonna, has anybody ever approached you about this tape, you know, that you didn't get to see the whole thing? I mean, his sightings or uh, encounters or any others? You know? Well, uh, I guess this is a good time. This is a good time to mention it. Uh, I have offered to make this particular video available to encounters. As a matter of fact, I talked with one of the producers uh, this past week. They are going to be on this show in two weeks. The producers of encounters are going to be joining me in studio in two weeks. And this would be a perfect time to ask them that question. Yeah. Okay, you can ask them directly. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we have run out of time. Perhaps more with Gene Huff at a later date. In the meantime, keep your eyes to the sky, your ear to the ground, and we'll see you tomorrow.